So, um, so for Manoj, uh, I have my, my opening question. You founded the Responsible AI Institute. Why did you create this organization and what do you do? What, what drove you to, to get this going? Why is it important? First of all, thank you for having me here and it's a real privilege and an honor to discuss some of our work on uh, such an important platform. So uh, the Responsible AI Institute is a nonprofit that I started six years ago uh, to essentially start building guardrails into AI systems that are being developed by businesses and by governments. And the idea and the importance of it came to me when I was running IBM Watson, which was like the chat GPT of 10 years ago. Um, I was given the privilege by the IBM board to take the Jeopardy playing machine and commercialize it. And about a year into the development, um, I really started getting a lot of questions from people about how do we make sure that the decisions the machine's making, in this case on cancer cure, are fair and explainable and are not gonna harm people. And as I started you know, poking into that area, then I realized that as technologists, most companies and most businesses and most people in the Bay Area and New York and others were looking at AI as a data and algorithms problem and not as a human impact and societal impact problem. So in order to help companies sort of reverse the direction on how they're thinking of AI, I created this nonprofit whose focus is on essentially assuring and certifying AI systems. We made it as a nonprofit because it needed that credibility. So think of us as the National Highway Transportation Board where you crash an AI and get a report on the quality of the car or a Moody's bond rating, you know, to see is it a double bond, double A bond or a junk bond. So that was about six years ago and I'm proud to say that uh, we've had dozens of amazing companies and members who are working with us now to adopt the tools that we build. Fantastic. Oh, I'm so glad to hear about that. So today's 21 April is World Creativity and Innovation Day. Could you tell us why it's important to raise awareness for creativity and in innovation in relation to the work that you're doing? And I'm also interested in hearing what you think the impact of AI is going to be on human creativity and innovation. Yeah, let me, let me start with the last one first. I have never been this excited about AI since back when I saw the Netscape browser in 1996, which made me quit my job at 3M, take 13 credit cards and $200,000 of credit and launch a company, which fortunately was acquired three years later. I think ChatGPT, what it demonstrated last year, is like the Netscape browser moment. Um, there is gonna be a tremendous Cambrian explosion of innovation that's about to happen, because what is happening is AI is now shifting from just classifying the world, which is what IBM Watson was, to understanding the world and now to creating the world. Essentially what ChatGPT is, is an interface where if you can type, you can code. So imagine being able to now generate an image to say, you know, create a video for me of a um, young girl running across a, a hillside mountaintop with a balloon in her hand, and now the video will get created for you. So we finally have gotten these AI models to a place where it has ingested all of the internet's knowledge and it understands how human knowledge and human being connects to each other. And now we are putting a simple interface just like HTML was 25 years ago. Now we are putting a simple chat interface where you can start creating images, text, code and applications by talking or typing into it. So it's almost like the invention of a paintbrush, right? So what we went from a paintbrush for creativity to keyboards for creativity, and now we are going for text and voice input for creativity. So this is just the beginning of this massive transformation. Uh, I'm, I'm a big lover of jazz, and I look at this as what happened in the 50s with the synthesizer. It was this massive explosion in jazz creativity because mm -hmm. now musicians could use a synthesizer and not have to eat, eat other people. So the same way, I think AI is now gonna work as our muse and our collaborator, and as an Iron Man Jarvis suit, or an Iron Woman Jarvis suit to be able to help us create new kinds of uh, material. And that's the exciting part. Hmm. So do you have any concerns about this though? You know, what, what, you know, as we're developing these technologies, what, what are considerations that we need to consider, especially in terms of, um, what, one of my concerns is the loss of human creativity that we will interact with other people, we'll be interacting with technology instead. 
Yeah, it's, it's a new form of engagement, new form of creativity, much like the cell phone and social media has made you connect back with your friend from high school that you normally wouldn't have probably. So I think I look at this as just progress of humanity. The concerns though are quite a few because the knowledge that we have fed this AI system has a lot of bias and issues built into it. So whatever we are putting the AI to work, whether it is to do a cancer diagnosis or mm -hmm. to help with creating an essay or to create with a campaign, a lot of those biases are going to start reflecting into it. So there is a tremendous, and then there are massive issues of data privacy. So when you give it some data, it ends up being, uh, you know, leaving the boundaries of a company. So areas like um, making sure that the, the data that is being fed in is not biased, making sure that data protection and privacy protection is being put in place, making sure that um, the job losses that this is going to create are managed in a proper way. I think there is a tremendous amount of that coming in. And the other side of it, making sure that we teach people how to use AI to create new kinds of jobs. Much like I used Excel and PowerPoint when I was coming out of MBA school and I was proud of it. I think this is the next generation of a Microsoft Office suite with generative AI uh, that we're coming about. But making sure that these tools have the right guardrails uh, with respect to data, with respect to how and where those systems are being applied is the focus of uh, both my companies right now and should be for the society at large. And it is not a problem that just the technologies can solve. It is a multi-dimensional problem that regulators, policymakers, groups like Peace One Day all need to come together and advocate for designing the systems in the right way. So tell me more about you know, the threat. So there's quite a bit of conversation in social media and, in, and various platforms in the public and you know, public square about the potential threat of irresponsible AI development. And you know, in terms of your your nonprofit and the companies that are members of it, what are you doing to address this? And then further, what do you think the role of AI will play in humanity's survival? There are people who are arguing that um, AI may be a, a threat, an existential threat to humanity. Where do you see see that coming down? Yeah, so I think um, when you look at the first part of it, um, the, the AI can. Actually, I mean, I'll take the last question first. In terms of addressing uh, humanity survival, I think all of the major problems that we have, from climate change, from war, from nuclear proliferation, space exploration, disease outbreaks and prevention, all of these things that are facing humanity, in fact, all of the UN's 18 development goals that I just saw here, all of them uh, have a massive amount of um, benefit that you can um, you know, get by applying AI into it. So everything from, you, wherever there is massive amounts of data that needs to be processed and the connections need to be understood and actions need to be ta taken, um, AI is what's going to really help us drive uh, change for that. And in terms of um, looking at what we can do about it, I think uh, starting with education, starting with capabilities around um, high schools, starting with business capabilities to understand the power and harms of this AI system. I think that's important and doing it not just in corporations but in universities with regulators as well as doing it with uh, policymakers and, and governments. So just like when the web came about, there was a whole new class of jobs like web developers and web designers and application server designers. There is a lot of those skills now coming up that we need to build out. The, challenge around this is that AI is too important to be left to a technologist. It is a societal issue, it's a business issue, so there is a real need for leadership uh, at a business level, at a policy making level, and at a consumer level um, to be able to advocate for explainability, privacy, and transparency of these systems. And that's where my, my focus is right now. So what kind of governance should we need to do we need to create then for this? Because I don't know, do we have a, an existence proof in terms of a previous technology where we've seen huge benefit, but also huge uh, danger with it? And, and, and is, are there models that we can go back to that we can look at to see how we can manage this, not just as technologists, as you say, it can't just be left to the technologists, but to society as well. So it's not just government, it's corporations, it's citizens. How do we get everyone on board? What does that look like yeah, we have a from a government standpoint? A good parallel, um, it's nuclear power, except AI is far more dangerous, can be far more dangerous than nuclear power. So the way we went about as countries, because you know you still need a lot of investments, 
lot of expertise to be able to um, come up with a fission material or a bomb or whatever with AI, with open source projects and the internet and compute being available at so low cost, the potential for bad actors to do harm is massive. And so in terms of how to go about it, there is this methodology. It's all about building capacity. It all starts with awareness and education. So there is a framework called ADCAR, which is not mine, which, which I really like, which starts with the A is for awareness. So really getting messages like this out so people understand that AI is going to be around us just like electricity. So anything that has power in it will probably end up having AI in it in 10 years. Uh, from your bulb to your you know, refrigerator and to your car and even your watches and, and glasses. So really getting aware of what, how these algorithms are shaping us and actually manipulating our behavior. And that's what social media is doing. So uh, the at car thing starts with A is for awareness. Second is, you know, is desire, really creating a desire to change or desire to apply it for the right way. Uh, this can transform education. This can provide opportunities to kids in parts of the world that have never had uh, a personal tutor um, that, that AI mm -hmm. can now. So creating the desire to drive the change is the second part of the rad car model. The third is knowledge, giving them the knowledge to be able to then start using these tools. And then fourth is ability, with actually getting them to implement it. And then the fifth and final one is reinforcement. So awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement, that's the cycle in AI that needs to get done. And that's some of the work I'm doing with, um, you know, not just groups like here, but also with universities like Cambridge and Harvard, where we are trying to build new curriculum, trying to actually create test beds. Because I believe in do tanks, not think tanks. There are a lot of think tanks talking about it. I, I, I would like to actually see do tanks. So we are building a test bed where people can actually go in and see an actual live implementation of generative AI uh, with actually NHS here in London and um, with the guardrails on it. So it's like creating a pilot of a nuclear power and showing how the containment system and the domes all come into play so that the goal is to give that away for free so everyone can start using it. Wonderful. So we have two minutes left. I have one last question for you. And this is the call to action for people who are listening. What would you say, uh, one thing to a young person who wants to go into the world of AI, what would that be? What kind of advice would you give to people who are listening right now? Yeah, I think this is one of the most fundamental changes. We're finally at a point with AI. It's one of those inflection points. It's like discovery of fire and how it changed humanity. I've been in this field for a long time. I have never seen the rate and pace of change that I'm seeing just in the last six months. And this is only going to go exponential. So in terms of my advice, I think it will be three things. One is awareness. Get aware. Get on YouTube. Start really learning on all these tools and the amazing innovations that are coming out. And I've never seen this in my life. This is way bigger than the internet, what's coming around the corner. So one is awareness. Second is advocacy. Advocate for companies to have ethical policies, demand these customers, uh, these corporations to show you how your data is being used and how AI is being used in their engagement with you. And last is support, support you know, groups uh, and foundations like Peace One Day or Responsible AI Institute that are nonprofit in making sure that they are bringing forward these tools and these do tanks so we can start adopting this because this is an exponential technology. The time to get safety and security into AI is now. If not, this is just going to get away from us and it's going to create a lot of um, issues and incidents that uh, will be quite damaging to not just business but also to society. So while it's the ex most exciting times, it's also the most uh, concerning times and getting people aware, getting people to advocate and getting people to support is, is what my call to action would be. Thank you so much. And now back to Afford.